Intimacy is the primary ingredient for connection. But what is intimacy? Intimacy is to bring yourself, who you are, to the center of the relationship and for the other person to do the same. It is to see into someone, to feel into someone, to listen into somebody, to fully understand them. To be intimate, you have to commit to being an expert on someone. Now it's tempting to think that it's possible to live your life without intimacy, but it isn't. Without intimacy in childhood, we don't actually develop a sense of who we are. We come to know ourselves as children through reflection. What that means is the reactions we're getting from other people, or even them mirroring the way we feel. Oh, you feel sad right now. Let's meet the reality that you're in right now. That lets us know who we are. So obviously, if there's an absence of that, we don't develop a sense of self. If it's particularly bad mirroring that we get, we develop a negative sense of self. But here's the thing that is so dangerous about that. We start to perceive ourselves existing in a parallel reality when what we don't get is intimacy. <clears throat> so you can understand this. Let's imagine that when you're a child, you feel angry or you feel sad or you feel afraid and your perception of a situation is that you got hurt. That's your reality. It's a perceptual reality. Now, if the people in your environment won't acknowledge that reality, so you're afraid and they won't even acknowledge that you're afraid, maybe they bypass it completely and say, hey, what do you want on your pancakes? There's such a discrepancy between where they are in their reality and where you are in your reality that you start to believe that two different realities exist. Now, this is happening at a very um, somatic level. It's happening at the deepest foundation of our being. It is not something that's happening rationally. So we just start to develop this concept that we are so deeply alone that it doesn't really matter who it is that we are in our environment with. Now let's pretend that you haven't had a horrific childhood, one where you didn't get any validation, weren't acknowledged, and grew up in a different parallel perceptual reality from your parents. The majority of people on the planet learn about these parallel perceptual realities when they go through extreme grief. Let's say that there's a death of a loved one. What you'll notice when something like that happens for you is that time stops. It's like the impact happens and at that moment life can no longer be the same. You can't feel good no matter how much you try. You're missing this person in every moment. The things that held joy for you don't hold joy for you anymore. And meanwhile, in the rest of the world, people are moving on with their lives. You feel like life has ended and they come over and they say, hey, let's go get a drink, come on. You start to feel this vast difference between your own perceptual reality and theirs. And this is, for most of us, this is our first experience with a parallel perceptual reality. And it is torment. I will never forget a time when I was at a public park it was a few years ago, and there was a park bench, and sitting on that park bench was a girl, a teenager. She had her arms completely cut up, I mean bandaged, and she was crying. And what I watched completely blew my mind. I watched joggers go past her, friends talking go past her, not one person noticed. It was as if this person might as well have been a ghost. She was existing in a parallel reality, of her own, which was completely not shared by anyone who was around her. And it was at that moment that I thought to myself, if people can be in a different perceptual reality and not even notice something like this, the rest of us who aren't so demonstrative with our state have no hope at all. To explain this concept further, there is no perceptual parallel reality that is set up in quite as extreme a way as is set up by abuse. Let me explain. Let's take a classic situation of incest, and let's pretend that it's daddy or an uncle. In this type of a situation, you basically have to create a split reality eventually. Why? Because what this perpetrator will do is that they'll rape you, and then an hour later, the next day, they ask you what kind of mayonnaise you want on your sandwich. 
you're having to go to Thanksgiving dinner with this person and act as if nothing has happened. And pretty soon, what starts to happen is that reality, which is day-to-day -day life, you know, the Thanksgiving dinner, the going to school, it actually starts to feel fake. The reality that you are in where you're being abused feels much more real to you. It's actually activating more of your nervous system that is dedicated to fight or flight. So basically, you start to get sucked into this parallel perceptual reality where you're actually living a double life. So that when you're at Thanksgiving dinner, you can't actually be at Thanksgiving dinner. It feels false, it feels fake. It is a parallel perceptual reality. In one reality, your reality is torture and pain and danger and dad's the enemy. In the other, life is mundane, you go to school, you have Thanksgiving dinner and dad is dad. When you're at Thanksgiving dinner or when you're at school or when you're doing these mundane things in this other parallel reality, you feel like you're just a thing in other people's worlds. It starts to feel like there's a pane of glass and you can see out but no one can see in. This is the real kind of parallel reality that we need to be concerned with in our lives here on Earth. This is the kind of parallel reality that makes it so people perceive themselves to be so alone and no hope that they commit suicide. The foundation of parallel perceptual realities is emotional invalidation. Now, I cannot stress enough how important emotions are, not just for our own lives, but in our relationships. I can't stress how important it is to respond to emotions appropriately. For this reason, I am begging you to watch the video that I created that is titled The Emotional Wake-Up Call. The reason why it's so important to watch this is because this dynamic that creates parallel perceptual realities can happen in all kinds of homes, even loving ones, the ones that are not overtly abusive. So I want you to think about these parallel perceptual realities as existing in a kind of um, sliding scale. So let's say that you grew up in a, a good home but just doesn't understand how to deal with emotions. You're gonna develop a parallel perceptual reality, but it's you know a mild one. It's still causing you pain, but it's, you know, not super, super, super intolerable. All the way over to the other side, you have the people who commit suicide. They're living in such an incredibly painful parallel perceptual reality that there is no way in their reality that anybody will be able to join them. And all of us fall somewhere on this scale until we learn how to address people so that they don't create a parallel perceptual reality. To understand how emotional invalidation creates parallel realities, we have to go back to the beginning. I want you to imagine a little girl who's unhappy. She's in pain because her family had to move to a different town. She has no friends here. She's lonely. She's afraid of the harshness of the new place. She misses so many things about the old place. If she looks unhappy or acts unhappy, if her parents can't create intimacy, they will respond in one of two ways. They will disapprove of her emotions, or they will dismiss or ignore her emotions. The parent who disapproves of the child's emotions is critical of their children's display of negative emotion and reprimand or punish for this expression. The parent who dismisses or ignores the child's emotions disregards them as important, ignores the child's emotions, or even worse, trivializes their child's emotions. They may even interact with this child as if she's fine. This creates a parallel reality between the parents and the child. The child is now in a reality that hurts. In her reality, tragedy and loss has occurred. In her reality, her parents are not even there, even if they're in the room physically. In the parents' reality, on the other hand, they are meeting the child's need and everything is good. The move was great because it provided new opportunities for better things. Because they can't actually see their daughter or feel her or understand her, they can't actually make any changes that would improve the way she feels. This little girl is isolated completely in her own parallel perceptual reality and her parents don't even notice. As life goes on, society may begin to mirror this split reality. She will perceive herself to be in one parallel reality when everyone else is in another. The torture of not only being in pain, but being in pain alone, or worse, watching people who are together and happy, is so painful that she might develop addictions. She'll do anything to escape that pain, and to be honest, the pain of the condition is worse than any drug or addiction she could ever choose. But because she's unconscious that she's experiencing a different perceptual reality, she just feels the torment and has no clue how to resolve it. She has no clue how to resolve it because resolving it would entail breaking down the separation between these parallel perceptual realities. She feels powerless to do that because she was powerless to do that with her parents. 
In that powerlessness, her option is to either escape from the pain through addiction or commit suicide. We are at risk of developing a parallel perceptual reality any time that we don't have intimacy. Any time someone doesn't see us, hear us, feel us, or try to understand us. So as to join into one reality. Now let's go one step further. Mental illness is, in fact, primarily caused by these perceptual realities. If you break down each one of the mental illnesses that we have diagnosed today, at the heart of them is a parallel perceptual reality. I'll give you some examples. So a schizophrenic, for example, a paranoid schizophrenic. Let's just pretend that this person actually feels like they're living in a perceptual reality that people are following them. That's their reality. Now everyone else is acting like it's completely normal. How would you feel today if army men broke into your house and they were literally raiding the house out to get you and everyone else was going, what? I don't see anything. It's one of the most gaslighting experiences. And what we do as a huge mistake in the mental field is that we try to convince them that their reality doesn't exist instead of trying to join them and interact in some way with what their actual reality is so that we can break down this veil between our reality and their reality. We have not managed to integrate people who are mentally ill because the rest of us judge their reality as false and invalid. If we judge them this way, we can never join them wherever they are so as to make any improvement. We can't find a way to integrate their reality with our own. Instead, we're just doing the same thing that parents do when they ignore, dismiss, and disapprove of their child's emotions. Someone suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder is also living in a parallel perceptual reality. So let's say that fireworks are going off. In this person's parallel perceptual reality, let's say they're a return vet from war, they are getting fired on, this is war. In our perceptual reality, it's just fireworks, what's the big deal? That's a different parallel perceptual reality. Someone suffering from depression is in a parallel perceptual reality of hopelessness where life is pointless. Someone who has panic attacks is in a different perceptual reality, one of imminent doom. And they're looking at everybody else who in the moment that they're having a panic attack are in a reality where they're acting like everything's normal and fine. Okay, so I'm gonna explain gaslighting for a minute because when we are in two different perceptual realities, it's a gaslighting experience. To gaslight somebody is to make them believe that their reality doesn't exist. So what you see, you don't see. What you hear, you don't hear. Your truth can't possibly be your truth. Now this, is, this can get really scary. Because it's a, a classic symptom that happens in dysfunctional homes. So let's say that you've got dad. Dad's drunk off his ass. He comes home, he falls down on the floor and passes out clean. What the mother in this scenario, let's pretend that she's a codependent, what she's going to basically do is say, you know what, kids, you know, you don't, he's just tired from work. So that's gaslighting because in that moment, the kids are going, I don't get this. Like he came in dead drunk and passed out. And you're telling me that what I see, I didn't see. What I feel, I don't feel. And what I'm hearing, I'm not hearing. My reality isn't true. The reality is dad's just tired from work. Now, when we have a parallel perceptual reality with somebody, we are setting up this type of gaslighting experience for each other, which is why it is so important to find a way to merge our realities so that we can basically find a place to meet in the middle so we're not isolated in our own realities. The real hell on earth is not suffering. The real hell on earth is suffering alone. When we are living in a parallel perceptual reality, this ultimately is where it leads us. We are suffering in our own reality and alone. We can't actually handle that, nor should we, nor should we put up with it in our species. So what we have to understand here is that we all benefit by getting rid of these parallel perceptual realities, tearing down the veil between them, really being intimate with each other. It doesn't just create torture for the people who are stuck in these parallel perceptual realities. It causes torture for all of us. Because eventually, when we're on the other side of a person who's in a parallel perceptual reality of pain, is that we lose them too. I'm going to just <laughs> give it to you straight. When you take a snapshot of human suffering, hell on earth, right? Suffering alone is the number one hell that you can experience. 
when we watch these images on our news channels of people who are suffering in earthquakes, people who are going through famine or disease, people who are starving to death even in Africa, I'm going to have to break it to you. That is not the deepest form of human suffering. In fact, it doesn't even come close for one primary reason. Because everybody is in the same perceptual reality, suffering together. The people who are suffering the most are the ones who are suffering in their own perceptual reality alone. It's a tragedy when people say, I never saw it coming, when their loved ones commit suicide. Because the reality that we have to face is, and that is why it happened. Because we don't have the level of intimacy in order to even know where this person actually is. If you did know, believe me, there's plenty of warning. I'm going to be honest with you. When people come to me and they tell me, I never saw it coming when someone commits suicide, my first response mentally is, and that's exactly why it happened. Another thing that we have to understand is that it is ignorant and incredibly cruel when we say in a derogatory way, misery likes company. We gotta literally cut this out of our vocabulary. Would you like to know why? Because unhappiness, misery, actually needs company. That's what it needs. It doesn't need somebody in a different parallel perceptual reality jumping in and saying, look at all the good in life. No. What suffering really needs is for somebody to join it. And from that space, where somebody is willing to actually join it, there will be an improvement in that vibration just by virtue of the fact that we are bringing the light of consciousness to that space. Connection is what people need in order to feel good and feel like their life is worth living in. All too often, people who are in pleasure cannot accommodate the reality of someone who is feeling pain. This is the real reason, actually, why any AA program or any support group works for anyone. It's because it's the only time that you actually perceive somebody joining your perceptual reality. It's the opposite of alone. Now, obviously, I've told you that alone, that feeling of isolation, is what causes addictions. So of course AA is working. <laughs> it is in the developing of genuine connection that we can tear down the separation between these realities so that these realities can merge. One reality must begin to account for the other and vice versa. Denial is like the veil that serves as the divider between two realities. It is within our capacity to accommodate polarities that our consciousness will find true progression. Pain must accommodate the reality of pleasure and pleasure must accommodate the reality of pain. To understand this concept fully, I want you to watch my video titled And Consciousness, the Modern Day Replacement for the Middle Way. There is no possibility for two people to stay close and to stay connected when they are living in two different parallel perceptual realities. And it is intimacy and our bravery to join people wherever they are that is going to bridge the gap between these two realities that make us so utterly alone. Have a good week. Thank you.